First and foremost, uh, thank you very much uh, for the session today. I, I cannot remember the last time I gave uh, this lecture. Uh, it must be about two or three years ago. But um, nevertheless, I think this afternoon, my task today is actually to give you some exposure or some idea about when we talk about the principle of organ transplantation. Now, uh, basically, when uh, this would be my outline of my um, presentation this afternoon, uh, basically, I'll be sharing with you about the different kind of uh, transplantation that you should know. Uh, what, are the, what, what, what are the things that when we talk about organ? Uh, what are the things that when we refer to a tissue uh, transplantation, uh, the types of organ, uh, the concept of uh, brain death? Uh, which is very important for you to understand because this is one of the pre-requirement uh, if uh, a, a, a patient or not a patient, uh, the relative uh, intent uh, or wish to have uh, a organ donation for their uh, loved one uh, that is actually, i.e. the patient uh, who has been declared brain death and uh, what are the requirements uh, to arrive uh, to to establish a diagnosis of brain death, i.e. when we talk about the brainstem function, and of course a few of the Islamic views uh, regarding organ donation, because uh, still the, when we talk about organ donation, still among the Muslims are not very popular as compared to uh, the non-Muslim uh, population. Okay. Now, um, so when we talk about organ, organ transplantation, basically uh, it is a process uh, where we will remove a healthy organ okay, from one person and then put it to another person okay, in which the other organ in that particular person has failed or maybe has injured. Lah. So, and usually it's done in the, in the situation of a life-saving procedures and also giving the hopes uh, that the recipient who received the organ will continue with uh, his or her life. Okay, And uh, when we talk about organ transplantation, uh, there are two kinds of organ transplantation. Uh, one is the cadaveric donor, means a patient is declared to be brain death and maybe the patient is actually a pleasure, is a pleasure uh, organ donation pleasure or the family wish uh, that the, the you know that whoever the, the, the patients to you become the organ uh, donor or it also can be in the form of living donor you know from one sibling uh, want to donate a kidney to another uh, his or her brother okay uh, certain piece of uh, you know often you you read in the newspaper uh, not often, but you see once in a while is people like to donate uh, part of their heart, uh, part of their liver, okay, to be donated to the uh, recipient, okay. So these are the living donor. And of course, when we talk about the uh, living donor, the process is 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 uh, what it calls uh, different from uh, cadaveric donor, obviously. Now, when we talk about organ, um, organ basically is a group of tissue uh, that perform a specific a specific function or group function. For example, like liver, the heart, uh, the kidney. So this is considered as a, an organ. So when we talk about organ trans transplantation, it means the whole organ is being is harvested from the donor and then put back into the recipient. Whereas when we talk about tissue, uh, transplantation is a part, for example, like cornea, right? For example, in our hospital, in suspect, uh, one of our ophthalmologists is uh, well versed uh, with uh, cornea transplantation. But unfortunately, most of uh, his uh, uh, cases, uh, the, the graph actually uh, actually imported from the US, okay? Not so much from locally, but it's from outside to get the uh, cornea graph or cornea tissue. Okay, so these are the two things. 
when we talk about organ transplantation versus a uh, tissue uh, transplantation. So uh, types of, of organ and tissue transplantation. Uh, number one, uh, for cornea, of course, tissue. Uh, there are certain condition. Uh, one of it uh, is actually uh, they make sure that there's no previous injury to the eyes uh, or any disease or any infection. Uh, in fact, can, uh, cornea can be removed uh, up to 12 hours uh, following uh, circulatory arrest or death in the hospital. That means to say when somebody passed away or uh, brain dead, so, so once you remove and off the ventilator, you still can harvest the cornea as opposed to other organ. Right? So that's the difference between cornea and, and other organ, which I'm going to share with you after this. Okay, uh, bone. So another tissue, we consider that tissue because you are not going to remove the whole bone inside, the whole skeletal in the body. Uh, basically, uh, once the, what they call a respective team, either like for example, cardiothoracic that will harvest the lung or the heart uh, and then the liver and the last bit will be joined by the orthopedics or by the ophthalmology to remove uh, certain areas like uh, mentioned you with cornea, uh, if uh, you know if the, the patient uh, wish that the whole body uh, missed you know uh, including the bone usually the orthopedic will repair all the pipes uh, the pipe the pipe yang kita pasang kat rumah tu to get ready so the once they remove uh, example the femur so after they remove the part of the bone then they will fix it using a pipe uh, so that the, the body will come still uh, like a uh, uh, living living person eh, rather than become like a apa nama, sotong eh? <laughs> very soft something like that so anyway so this uh, uh, example of a tissue um, transplantation bone okay so either it can be in the form of cortical bone uh, it also can be in a in the form of uh, cancellous bone and usually if once you harvest the bone you need to have a bank so unfortunately in uae we do not have a bank uh, neither in hta uh, when I was working in uh, USM, they do have a bone bank because you need to have a bone bank for uh, preservation of this graft uh, to ensure the survival and uh, and then you can use this one on uh, accordingly lah, basically, right? Of course, the third one is the bone marrow, but usually bone marrow is uh, done uh, in the living donor, right? Especially uh, in the case of uh, what they call the blood disorder diseases like thalassemia, so where do they have us? Uh, bone marrow to get all the stems, stem cells. Okay, next uh, is the kidney. So kidney is, uh, if you understand the, the definition which I have mentioned you earlier on, uh, kidney means referring to organ donation. So this is the prerequisite or pre-requirement before someone can donate their kidney. Uh, number one, there's no evidence of the previous kidney disease. Uh, number two, ensure that they have a good perfusion uh, good urine out, output out, you know, uh, and also no evidence of uh, infection. And uh, in fact, the indication, as long as the, the first three are all, uh, what do you call, achieved, even they are less than 70, they still can donate their kidney. So they must say, kalau you 60, 65, and you still have a good uh, renal function, no evidence of uh, kidney disease, then, uh, you know, you can donate your kidney. Right? Or liver, so but this is not the example for the liver. Lah, basically, uh, for liver, the pre is prerequisite uh, precondition before a transplantation no alcohol, no evidence of drug abuse, uh, no existing or pre existing liver disease. Uh, you know, uh, we have to ensure that liver function is normal, and for this age, usually uh, it is recommended less than 65 years old. Okay. And for the heart, so the precondition, uh, no evidence of uh, heart disease, uh, you know, either includes a coronary artery disease or one bullet heart disease, all this congenital condition. And sometimes uh, in a situation uh, in the hospital uh, where a patient uh, develop a cardiac arrest, so if you, uh, the team or the primary team uh, do the CPR, so that is not a good uh, what they call a candidate for uh, organ organ transplantation because you may have injured uh, the heart during the uh, procedure of a CPR. So uh, 
barat should not be any internal cardiac massage or cardiac arrest or direct cardiac trauma and the clinical examination cardiac examination must be normal supported by the normal EEC, ECG, the chest x you know, echo and the in ICU setting uh, you know uh, there's no evidence uh, you know of a high anotrope support uh, small dose is okay but high is not good okay so you cannot subject the patient for uh, what they call heart transplant but of course we can subject the patient for other things the cornea and the bone or maybe other other organ but not the heart right so for the heart usually it is recommended for those less than 55 years old okay i have one experience when i was working in uh, usm last time uh, there was a patient a chinese boy uh, at the age of 17 or 18 years old uh, who had a brain tumor a geminoma okay so primary brain tumor is not a contraindication for organ organ transplantation organ donation so the father uh, what they call requesting or requested or has requested uh, what they call um, for a full organ donation so so uh, the heart the liver uh, the kidneys both kidneys uh, the cornea and the bone were actually harvested from the patient and uh, but somehow that heart was actually transplanted to an older uh, recipient uh, i think around uh, 50 or 60 years old uh, but unfortunately uh, the recipient passed away a few months later so not sure what, why why was the reason uh, maybe the heart uh, for a 17 years old 18 years old must be very strong for a recipient of uh, 50 or 60 so but anyway uh, for a precondition uh, for heart organ donation, so the age recommendation is less than 55. So, uh, for lungs, the precondition, uh, of course, no trauma to the lung, uh, no infection, uh, ensure that the the uh, the gas uh, exchange via your FiO2 is good. Uh, Non-smoker. Uh, also, even ex-smoker, but provided it must be less than ten years. Ten years, huh? stop smoking from the time from uh, the uh, you diagnose the patient to have a brain death. Uh, no chronic uh, lung disease, and so on. Okay, so the last bit will be the no evidence of malignancy, and quite similar to the heart, usually recommended less than 50, 50 years old. Okay, so these are the conditions. Because uh, when I give a talk in UMP last time, there was a question coming from the public asking uh, about the issue of being a smoker, an ex-smoker. So, so I told him this is the condition, you know, so it must be less than 10 years from the time uh, you stop smoking. Okay, so, but it's not absolute contradiction that you cannot, you can, you cannot donate just because you are a normal smoker, ex-smoker. Right, pancreas. Okay, you may be surprised. Yes, pancreas can be also harvested as part of the organ transplantation, provided there's no history of diabetes because you know the insulin is derived from the pancreas. Uh, you have to ensure that the serum amylase is normal. Uh, patient has no history of alcohol uh, in abuse and uh, no history of inflammation or pancreatitis uh, involving the pancreas. Okay, so these are the precondition for uh, pancreas. Uh, uh, transplantation okay so these are the organs that you can harvest okay so as of in Malaysia setting okay so the for the for the tissue you can harvest the cornea and the bone and uh, for the organ you can harvest the heart the lung okay the liver the kidneys and the pancreas okay and in Malaysia so they usually usually we have this uh, committee right but I'm not sure because the last time when I checked in the website, uh, they have not updated the new committee. So therefore, if you slide here, it's quite old. It's 2003 because some of the um, of the uh, committee actually has retired. Eh? For example, like uh, Mr. Johari here, he's the head of services of neurosurgery for KKM. But he's already retired about two years ago. 
the chairman Datuk Rani previously was in KKM left, left to Ambang Putri uh, Raymond Azman Ali neurologist in UKM I think really uh, about two years ago almost retired from ministry from from university so I'm not sure who are the new uh, committee members but nevertheless I just like to show you that in, in, in Malaysia we have a committee that look and that go through and review uh, all the what they call uh, the issues pertaining brain death okay because if you go by different countries uh, even our neighbor in Thailand or in Indonesia they have a different set of rules and uh, when it comes to brain death okay so each country have their own committee they have their own rules and criteria to follow so therefore please and you when you answer exam you must follow the criteria set in in this country in Malaysia so you cannot use or your reference outside from Malaysia okay because in Indonesia for example to uh, confirm or to certify uh, brain death requires a lawyer okay but in this country there is no, no need to bring a lawyer for a lawyer ni so it is enough uh, for two physician or two doctors uh, which I'm going to explain after this uh, to certify whether the patient is brain dead or not okay so that is the message which I like to to, to share with you today right. now definition is very important so we will talk about brain death basically brain death is a state okay it's a state or it's a condition where the function of the brain point number one as a whole including the brain stem point number two Point number three is irreversibly lost. So, maksudnya kalau dalam exam, you need to have these three keywords. Number one, function of the brain as a whole, okay, including the brain stem. Point number two, and irreversibly lost, because there are certain condition in which the function or dysfunction of the brain or the brain stem can be reversible. Okay, there's some, some condition which I'm going to share with you this that can be reversible. For example, we, I can, if I can share with you now, is certain uh, drugs, okay, or alcohol intoxication, okay, in some situation uh, can make or mimic the patient as having a brain death. But once you give certain things like uh, vitamin, that can reverse the situation. So when it comes to brain death, it must be an irreversible condition. So you cannot reverse anymore, all right? So these are the three points. And how to diagnose? You need to have these three things, three conditions. Number one, patient must be coma. One day coma, okay? Number two, your examination must show that the patient has got no evidence of functioning of the brain stem reflexes, mean basically absence. And the third one is apnea. Patient is not breathing, tak bernafas. So these are the three preconditions, okay, before you decide whether the patient is brain dead. So they, they need, in examination, they need a coma, brain, uh, brain stem flexes pun dah tak ada, and the one patient cannot breathe, apnea, right? So because why? Because in this country, the diagnosis of brain death is primarily on the clinical. So means if you can complete the clinical examination, i.e. to do all the brainstem function in your examination okay you fulfill all those okay, then you can confirm whether the patient is brain dead or not unless the situation where you cannot complete that's where your requirement for an extra investigation which i'm going to share with you later example will be like eeg right so much so you can complete the whole brainstem function in your examination then you have to add on uh, what they call eeg Example, what situation? So if somebody has got a, what we call severe traumatic head injury, means, you know, a very bad facial injury, mata terkeluar, you know, uh, face, face is, doesn't look like a face anymore. So how are you going to, how are you going to do a full uh, brain stem function? Not possible. So that's where you're going to do all this, what they call as ancillary tests. So either EEG or other things right, that you can utilize to confirm uh, whether the patient is brain death or not. Okay, so that's why I told you right uh, just now that in this country, uh, you know, we have already set uh, up a number of rules how we 
uh, diagnose patient with brain death. So primarily, primarily clinical. Okay. Now who can who can who 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 are or which doctor are qualified? Okay. So it goes to point five point two. It must be a two specialists who are competent at least three years upon graduation. Masonya. Kalau you today you are a, a specialist, then tomorrow you want to do a brain stem uh, assessment or brain brain death assessment, then you are not qualified. So you have at least three years, only three years and above, and well trained in the brain death assessment, then only you are actually a qualified doctors to go and do this exercise. Otherwise, you are not eligible. Then of course, preferably. Uh, abuse, anesthesiologist, pakar abuse, physician, okay, a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. Okay, no mention about orthopedic surgeon, no mention about the radiologist, okay, uh, not mentioning about forensic pathology. So basically, you know, uh, because we has, a, you know, uh, this task is, is a very difficult task. I tell you because I have been involved uh, in this when I was in HTA for seven years because you know, to diagnose somebody uh, with brain death is actually quite a heavy task. Okay, especially being a Muslim. So you not tentukan sama ada the patient ni kematian otak. Nah. Because one simple mistake, if you declare the patient is brain death, uh, and then you you sign, uh, and then, you know, maybe you miss something, patient patient still survive, alive. You know, life in the in the in the coma two situation, but you declare the patient to be brain death, and you subject patient for organ donation. Means you have done you have done a crime and also a sin, basically. That's why you don't take this uh, as a very what do you call uh, uh, very simple thing. So you must take it as a serious business uh, because uh, small mistakes or any mistake that you make in your decision making, uh, you know, when you die later on, Allah Taala will ask you definitely. Okay, kenapa you you know, patient is survive, you may suka suka, buat 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 gini, you know, then you certify, patient is still alive, and you submit the patient dah, jantung dia mati lah, you remove the jantung, then that's it, patient will die. Alright, so for this country, at least three years postgraduate, preferably all this uh, specialty, alright. And then usually it is done by two person, okay, you look at 3.4.1, carried out by two specialists, and usually for adult, the test will be repeated, okay, six hours later. So if you do it, for example, now at three, now it's three p.m. So after six hours, then you have to come back, okay, uh, and to repeat the whole test, okay, your final test to confirm the uh, the patient the uh, brain death or not, okay. Now if you look at three point four point three, now the first round, if you do the brain death assessment, so it can be the same the same cohort, I mean the same doctors, as I mentioned, you can start with uh, uh, Doctor A and Dr. Doctor B. So when you repeat for another test at six hours later, it can be the same pass, Dr. A or Dr. B, or it can be a different pass of doctors, Dr. C or Dr. D, it doesn't matter. So maksudnya kalau A, B, C, D means you need four people to involve with the test lah. So because sometimes in certain uh, certain hospital, uh, you know, uh, they, they may not want too many people to involve uh, so that you know you have more accurate in terms of accuracy in terms of your, your assessment. So therefore, the same pair will come back at six hours later to do the re-examination to confirm that. Right? But in a situation where you have luxury number of uh, what they call doctor specialists which are qualified to confirm, then there's no issue of uh, other other two pairs or another pair to come to do a re-examination at six hours later. Right? Now, for children, it's different. Children need their line skin. Okay? Can you look at the table above? It depends on the age of the, of the patient. For patients who are actually at the age of seven days to two months, okay, the hours between two examinations is about two days, 48 hours, plus NEG times two. Okay? But uh, when you compare to adults, different. Adult, there's no need for EG. Provided you can what they call complete the whole uh, exam, uh, what we call brainstem when your assessment and six hours apart. Okay, so four two months to one year, 
24 hours apart okay plus eeg and more than one years old 12 hours apart and there's no need for eeg okay so that's why it's different okay between uh, adu an adult and also a uh, children when you when it comes into the brain brain stem uh, upon them breath brain death uh, certification okay next segment is about the brain stem function i'm sure you have uh, seen you have done some of this uh, examination so i start off with the pupils okay so this is number one so you have to start with the pupils uh, that is why in the as i mentioned just now the situation where you have uh, when the patient has got very bad uh, facial injury okay uh, it's almost impossible for you to actually look into the pupils because there's no eye there mata pecah okay not possible to okay so you already got one missing in your assessment but in this situation where the face is uh, what you call intact, so you have to look at the pupils. Okay, look at the response, whether the pupil is uh, re uh, re uh, reactive or not reactive to light, and look at the position uh, and the size of the of the pupils. Okay, that's number one. That's easy. Number two is the oculocephalic reflex. Okay, so oculocephalic reflex, or in the, sometimes we coin as a dull eyes. Okay, so this is if you look at the picture there, okay, next next to this uh, slide here. Okay, so you will turn the head very fast. Okay, then you, uh, what do you call, you will see whether the eye is in a normal person like me and you, because we, we are not brain dead. Uh, when we turn our head, for example, to the right, our eye will try to maintain our gaze towards the midline. So you will see that the eye will move towards the midline. That is a situation where our our brain fun, our brainstem function is still intact. But in a situation where this the brain dead, what happens is once you turn the head towards the right, and the eye will follow the to the right. Once you move and turn the head towards the left, your eye or the patient's eye will move towards the left. Okay, so that means you say. There is actually absence of the oculocephalic reflex. Kalau you tak percaya, lepas ni you boleh boleh buat. You tengok, then you see whether it's actually true that what I say. Or not. Okay, so if I can repeat again, in the intact brainstem reflex, once you turn your head to the right, your eyes will your will move conjugate towards the left. Okay, towards the midline eh, to 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 maintain the gaze. Okay, similarly, vice versa. If you turn your head towards the left. Your eye will try to maintain and look to, through medially to the midline to make sure that it's actually your gaze is maintained. Okay, so which is not which is not present in person with a brain dead situation. But um, you can't do this in a situation where you have not ruled out a cervical injury. So most of the trauma patient that comes in, they will come in with a cervical collar. So if you have not done uh, what you call a full examination including the x-rays or in particular the ct scan of the cervical uh, and i don't think you would comfortable to remove the cervical that is quite difficult for you actually to um, complete this examination you do not you do not want to cause more problem kalau kata to patient to still survive suddenly you turn the patient's head to the right you, you crack the cervical and the patient just die on you yang induce the, the, the death rather than what I call uh, doing examination. Okay, so one of the problem to fulfill this, this examination is when the patient has got unstable or what I call when it's a fracture of the spiker or you have not ruled out a full uh, what I call assessment of the, of the cervical. Okay, the third one is the what we call as a vestibular catholic reflex. Okay, now point number one, which I like to mention here. When somebody has got a nystagmus, okay, nystagmus. So a nystagmus can be a, a fast component or it can be a, 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 a slow component. So the direction of the nystagmus is dictated by the fast component. Okay, same as you say, kalau you tengok later on, when you have the opportunity in the in the ward, somebody who has got a nystagmus, so they kalau they do, they mesti ada dua component, fast component and the short components. So the slow components, so the direction of the next statement is dictated by the fast component. 
So in this particular examination, the vestibular catholic reflex or caloric test, okay? This is a situation that you're gonna inject about 15 mils of water, okay? So uh, two kinds of water, one is a cold water, okay, another one is the warm water, but usually we just do a cold water. Warm water ni not lah, the 100 degrees warm in your water, otherwise you introduce the water into the patients here, then that's it lah. You know, patient-patient uh, coma, tengah coma-coma, dia boleh bangun. Uh, you actually irrigate with hot water. So we don't do so much of hot, hot, hot water. Usually we just do a, a cold water. Cold means it's a ice cold water, right? So, maksudnya, simple, yang tadi pincin pertama, uh, the fast component, the, the next step must be direction is dictated by the fast component. Point number two, cows. Cold opposite, warm, same. Okay, they must say if you inject a water, in the, what you call, in the, apa nama, uh, right ear. So if this is, uh, what you call, uh, functioning punya brainstem peer reflex is still intact. So you will see the, uh, the next step must will be towards the opposite side. Okay. Uh, contoh ya, macam uh, cow, cold, uh, apa nama, cows, cold, opposite, warm scene. So, maksudnya kalau you irrigate a 50 min of uh, ice cold water in the right ear, so that, 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 that will introduce the nystagmus and the fast components will be towards the left. Okay, so that's why the cold op uh, opposite won't seem. Okay, so, you, so before you do that, before you even thinking of uh, infusing or irrigating this uh, water inside the patient's ear, you must in inspect the tympanic mem membrane. So that means to say you need to have that uh, autoscope. Okay, you look at both ears, right and left ears to ensure that there's no tamponate membrane operation. If there's a tamponate membrane operation, then you cannot perform or complete this examination. So it's considered invalid. Okay, so step number one for this, check the ears, the tamponate membrane using your autoscope. Kalau both tamponate membranes is intact, then you can proceed with the uh, cold irrigation, 50 ml of water into the patient's ear and look at the nystagmus. Okay, and of course in the brain death in situation, they they will not be a nystagmus lah, uh, because the the function is already gone. Okay. Okay, number seterusnya, uh, the facial sensation and the facial motor responses. Okay, this is easy, where you just give a little bit of stimulus. Okay, at the, in the chest around the facial and you can see if there's any evidence of facial grimace if you give some stimulation tengok dia rasa macam muka muka tu mengeyuk ke something like that uh, so if patient do that means the patient is still alive okay uh, then uh, the other thing which is uh, you can do in this is actually look at the cornea reflex right so then some people are saying hey, doctor can we do a cornea reflex in comatose patient can boleh okay so you just open the, the eye lips, okay, eye lips, just book out a little bit, hold with one finger, you use another hand, take a cotton and rub the cornea, right? The same thing that you do on the alive patient. So if the patient is still alive, uh, the brainstem function is still intact, you still you, you will see the contraction of the of the lips, the eyelids. Okay. Uh, kalau tak percaya, later on, I don't know if you got the opportunity to go to ICU, you can you can you can demonstrate okay then you can uh, see uh, panama whether the corner reflex is present or not present in the patient okay so this is the things that you would perform when you examine for the facial sensation and also look for the facial motor responses seterusnya the uh, the pharyngeal and the tracheal reflexes okay so this is uh, you know most of this patient or in fact all of, of this patient are actually uh, intubated and ventilated okay so what you do is actually because uh, the ATT is there so you pass through uh, some of the what do you, call, you pass through the suction ke, uh, tongue depressor ke, straight and look uh, all these reflexes okay for tracheal reflexes it's easy you pass through the what do you call, suction through the ATT and then you can you you you, you pass through and then Kalau patients still have uh, get reflex, patient can start uh, bucking. Okay, so for pharyngeal ni, basically you take you you will take the tongue depressor and then you masuk ke mulut dia, you try to touch at the back of the throat. 
Okay, so that's what it means by pharyngeal. So we will look at these two components. We look at the pharyngeal and also the uh, tracheal reflexes, okay, to, to decide okay, whether the function is still intact or not. Okay. So those are the brainstem uh, function uh, that you need or required for you to fulfill. And uh, the third part of the uh, examination to confirm whether the patient is brain dead or not is the apnea, apnea test. Apnea test basically is very simple. The objective is, is actually to look whether the patient is breathing or not. So we will uh, eventually disconnect the ventilator from the patient and then we will assess the patient whether the patient is breathing or not. Why? How? By actually measuring the PO2 and PCO2 because in a live person like me and you, we will suck in, we will inhale the uh, oxygen, but we will exhale the PCO2 in a person who, can, who are not breathing. So neither the PCO2 is coming in, but the PCO2 will start to accumulate inside the, in the, in the, in the blood, okay? Because it's, it's not being thrown out, exhaled out. Okay, so, but before you disconnect the ventilator from the patient, so you need to give the patient 100% oxygen. Okay, so you wash, the panggil wash up, uh, wash up period about, about 10 minutes. Uh, kemudian you will take ABG, alright, because you need to have a baseline before you disconnect the patient. Okay, kemudian once you have to, you deliver 100% of, uh, apa nama, you have to do the wash out. Kemudian you will remove the apa nama ventilator kemudian you you will supply the patient with or you connect the patient with uh, six liter of oxygen straight to the to the ETT uh, tadi tadi you disconnect from ventilator sekarang dia dia disconnect kemudian you sambung oksigen direct uh, from the wall to direct six liter per minute okay then then you start measuring the ABG tadi you dah ada apa nama uh, baseline ABG when you have the 10 minutes of uh, washout on the ventilator. Uh, you have a, 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 a baseline. Kemudian you disconnect the ventilator. Uh, sambung direct dengan oksigen, 6 liter per minute. Kemudiannya every 5 minutes. Some people take five, 10 minutes. So I usually take 5, 5 minutes. Alright. Then you every 5 minutes, you have ABG. Every 5 minutes, you have ABG. Okay. So kalau sekiranya after 5 minutes, you find that the uh, PCO2 more than 55, Okay, means the patient is not breathing. Okay, so means the apnea test is positive, right? But at the same time, you also have to observe, okay, when you when you, you put direct oxygen on six liter, your job is actually to look at the chest, whether there's any chest movement or not, okay? But the objective way in which you uh, measure the ABG, the PCOT usually will climb, climb uh, after five minutes, okay? Uh, uh, more than 55 uh, millimeter mercury is considered positive. Okay, so you can continue this. If after five minutes, the MEPCO2 still not 55, you can repeat another ABG, another five minutes. So eventually you can uh, do that a total of 15 minutes. So under five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. All right. So unless situation where um, uh, suddenly after five minutes, tiba-tiba uh, the punya blood pressure drop. Yeah, brought everything drop. So you miss your PFD test tak valid. So you just have to take the ventilator and reconnect to the patient. Okay, maybe you have to repeat it again. Okay, so that is cause this on consider fail lah or the apnea test. So you have to come back and later and 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 you have to do it again. Okay, so this ah uh, this is what it mean by uh, apnea test. So basically disconnect from the net ventilator and find out whether the patient is breathing or not. Uh, by objectively measuring the ABG, okay, look specifically look at the PCO2. Okay, as I mentioned just now, yang uh, early on, okay, the situation or condition that may interfere with the diagnosis of brain death. Okay, uh, so because you are unable to fulfill all the clinical uh, examination, so therefore your the requirement to have a complementary test, which I'm going to share you later on. For example, this EEG, as I mentioned before. Number one, severe facial or cervical spine injury. Okay, facial injury tak boleh take pupil pun tak boleh tengok. You can't do a colocaphilic reflex because the cervical injury. Or patient may have already existing popularity abnormalities. Very difficult for you to quantify whether this is truly due to the brain death or maybe it's existing uh, apa nama, popularity abnormalities, uh, certain toxic sedative drugs. 
uh, anti-trastically, anti-depression, all those stated there. These are the medication which can mimic a person looks like the patient is actually brain dead, but it's actually a reversible condition. Okay, the last one is sepnia or severe respiratory disease with PCO2 retention. So all the situation may not allow you to fulfill the clinical examination or clinical criteria to confirm brain death. Okay, therefore you need to have a confirmatory test. So what are the confirmatory tests? Best is angiogram. But of course, like angiogram is invasive. Tapi kalau you tengok, eh, you tengok, this is a normal person. The one on the right, you can see this is brain death. So there's no flow inside the there's no flow. So then we should see the blood is actually cut, the cut neck, eh? it doesn't flow into the brain. All right, so, so conventional angiogram is the best eh? investigation to confirm a brain death, All right? Other things that you can utilize, uh, ultrasound, eh? transcranial ultrasound Doppler, where you will look at this, uh, all parameters, you look at the wave, the, the height of the wave to decide whether they stay flow or not. Once you see the flow inside the brain, you know it's the patient is not yet brain dead. Okay. EG, as I mentioned you just now, right? So EG ni kalau you talk to the electrophysiologist punya person, EG usually kalau you request for brain death, they have said you have to use the brain death punya mood lah. Okay. Uh, because then you see whether there's still any uh, brain activity or not. Okay, to decide whether the brain activities is present or absent. Okay. Another one is the nuclear imaging. Okay, where you use the nuclear, you give the patient, inject it. You can see here. Okay, there's no flow into the brain. So we call it as an empty skull sign. Okay. So those are the, what they call, um, uh, investigation, uh, confirmatory tests, okay, uh, that you can use. Uh, to help you or to guide you as to whether the patient brain dead or not, uh, if you are unable to fulfill all the clinical criteria. Okay. So once you diagnose brain death, you don't know especially the kematian otak, then you have to inform the family. Okay. You have to inform the family, uh, and then of course, uh, sorry, this is the events of organization. So once the patient all got, got all this, the, the three pre-work requirement tadi yang kita kata koma, reflexes, all those things. So you can inform the patient that the patient looks like uh, or presumed to have a brain death. Therefore, uh, you need to have a, a confirmatory of the brain death uh, using the clinical examination. Uh, kalau tak boleh, then you have to use the confirmatory test. Uh, kemudiannya, you will inform in Malaysia punya setting uh, you will contact the, what do you call, the transplant coordinator. Okay, so, kalau kat SESMAT ni, kita tidak ada transplant coordinator. Uh, even though I have been uh, evolving with HTA for seven years, uh, until today, they have not appointed anybody from SESMAT to be the transplant coordinate, coordinator for SESMAT lah. So, but there is uh, in HTA. So, the primary team will inform the uh, brain death, I'm sorry, the, tra uh, the, the trans local transplant coordinator. They usually will come and talk to the family too. Uh, once the family is in agreement to allow for organ transplantation, then they will then, uh, what they call, uh, call the national or alert the national uh, apa nama, uh, organ transplantation team, which is located in HKL. Okay, so so they can alert lah. So they can alert. Kemudiannya uh, during the discussion with the family members, then they will they will decide lah. So some other it will full uh, organ transplantation, or it may be just end up like just a tissue punya transplantation for cornea or bone something like that. So so the family there will be a discussion between the local uh, transplant coordinator and the family members to decide uh, how extensive the organization uh, or transplantation be. Kemudian dia akan inform the national one. So if, for example, that patient to agree or the relative agree for a full uh, organ donation, uh, the heart, the liver, the lung, the kidneys uh, and the rest, 
then the national uh, apa nama transplantation coordinator akan alert all the surgeon okay so so once that happen that it becomes automatically urusan seri paduka baginda yang dipertuan agung that means to say it has become as a national punya uh, apa nama activity uh, therefore uh, they are can set uh, time when the patient will be uh, sent to the ot for organ uh, harvest and the team that will come in to harvest the organ so they can coordinate so these are the function of the transplantation or the transplant coordinator local transplant coordinator all right so maksudnya dah alert pap so they say okay never mind they kata the team from kl will come say for example even malam pun dia datang say now say for example, now is ready 3 3 3 30 lah for example so they say okay never mind Uh, set by 7 o'clock patient will be pushed to OT 7 o'clock right so maksudnya by 6 o'clock tu patient the all the team from IGN from Selayang will come in okay they already stand by in OT okay and the police also will be stand by because penting eh? you need to have the all these riders to escort uh, uh, not to escort sebelum pada harvest the important after they harvest the organ because they do not want to have a delay Right. So at the same time, the national coordinator ni akan juga cari recipient. So maksudnya kalau patient ni dia nak uh, donate or the relative wish to donate heart, dia akan cari uh, recipient for the heart, recipient for the lung, recipient for the liver, recipient for the kidneys because there are two kidneys. If there are two good two kidneys, there will be two kidneys. So so be, there will be two recipient for for kidneys. Kalau dia ambil pancreas, ambil pancreas lah. So all this event will be coordinated and will be done simultaneously. Dan mesti sih pukul 7 dia buka. All right. So the first thing come out will be the heart for example. Pas heart dengan ni dia dia time is very short. So they need to be quick. So the heart the heart, the liver and the kidney for two kidneys, one heart, one liver akan masuk ke dalam ice box, terus masuk dalam kereta. Alright. Kemudiannya the surgeon yang harvest ni akan masuk kereta ni terus pergi ke airport ataupun helikopter yang tunggu dekat depan padang I don't know, padang pemunting tu dekat ada is a is a Indian quail kalau kat HTA tu. So kalau helikopter helikopter lah dia datang. So dia akan naik, kemudian ni dia fly. So whatever yang dah buka tu will be close by the local surgeon. Meanwhile in HKL dia pun dah harvest lah. So maksud dia be two people there yang akan receive kini dia tengah buka kat sana yang the person that going to receive the heart pun dah buka di IGN the person that going to receive the liver going to buka so maksudnya by the time the organ arrive in in lembah kelang so this organ will be channel to the respective uh, center and then they will be put into the all these four patient lah two kidneys one liver one heart okay so that's how it is being coordinated so it's not an easy thing but uh, but they have a good flow flow of chart right of course certain things that needs to be done prior to that yang blood grouping tu biasalah serology biochemistry hematology that they want standard lah okay so these are the some rough idea lah uh, when when it comes to the organ donation ah uh, yang ni ni biasalah ni notify pathology dulu dulu kita bab donor make sure have duty to say goodbye transfer to OT but this one I already mentioned to you lah okay so what the condition contraindication to organ donation It's absolute contraindication when there's a malignancy except for CNS as I mentioned to you the boy okay because CNS tumor ni does not see one thing about a brain tumor is that dia ni asobiah alright a brain tumor is a asobiah punya tumor because it does not go out beyond the brain usually okay except for certain things lah Uh, like geminoma, uh, CNS lymphoma, sometimes it can actually drop mats into the spine but only central nervous system lah but it does not go beyond the central nervous system it doesn't go to the uh, lung, it doesn't go to the uh, what you call, it doesn't go to the liver, it doesn't go to the gut uh, like other malignancy like breast cancer, anything like that, alright? Systemic infection, patient who has got hepatitis, all this condition Okay, this is absolute contraindication. Relative indication is diabetes, 
or a patient who actually older lah, older lah 70 tahun eh. 70 tahun pun you know even cast after 5 years pun dah ada wear and tear kalau age 70 pun you make sure maybe a wear and tear yeah. so I'm not sure when it, whether anybody like to take any organ from a 70 years old guy lah but nevertheless kalau this young this uh, old chap guy has got a good cornea then he, he or she can always donate in terms of the tissue lah maybe ya yeah, tissue or even bone okay so that can be how it even bone pun kalau kata uh, uh, 70 dah menopause okay tak pasal-pasal bagi recipient we apa nak osteoporotic bone okay it doesn't make any it doesn't make good for the recipient all right all right so the last bit for today just some of the uh, islamic views uh, for everyone information, I mean, this is not something new in the Islamic world. Uh, in fact, in this country, it has been actually uh, been discussed way back in 1970s, in, in which most of you are, are not are not yet uh, in, in this world. Eh? You all semua tak, tak dilahirkan lagi pun. In 1970s, okay? So, they have already mentioned about this. Uh, because according to the Majlis Fatwa Kebangsaan, and this is because organ transplantation and donation fulfill one of the five objectives of Makasi al Shariah. That is the objective of Islamic way, namely preservation of human life. Okay, these are the arguments that they concluded in the 1970s punya Majlis Fatwa punya council. So, question number one uh, usually we get from the public can Muslim receive organs from non Muslims? Uh, yes, no restriction. Argument is human organs can be categorized as Islam or otherwise because we use organ to perform uh, religious duties, the means of life, uh, means of living. Okay, that's the issue. Okay. Uh, question number two Can Muslim donate organs to non Muslim? Yes, in Malaysia, non Muslim are categorized as uh, kafir zimi, uh, and then they should be helping when they are in it. So, that's the issue on this. Will the donor bear the sins of the persons who receive? His or her organ, your fund is no, because the argument according to uh, Surah Al Anam, every Mukallaf, a person who has been reached the age of maturity and some mind is possible for his own deeds. Maksudnya, tak ada kebengena pun dengan physical. Eh, kalau you dah, kalau you jahat jahat lah, eh, kalau you baik baik lah. So, you nothing to do with the organ that you receive. Okay. All right, I think this is the end of my presentation today. I'm one of the uh, organ uh, apa nama uh, transplantation page. Uh, ni bukan gimmick ya. Eh? This is a real one. So I hope that the rest will follow uh, also. Okay. So with that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. If there's any question, more happy to take out. Ada soalan ke? Um, doktor, saya ada uh, soalan. So, uh, the first one, kalau in the situation, uh, in the brain death situation itself, um, and or in the situation where the patient already cannot decide whether this treatment is good or bad to them. So, I just want to uh, uh, ask you regarding at what time of, uh, at what point of time did the patient lose their autonomy, means that their patient's autonomy, because uh, like the case that you have mentioned, that uh, at one point of time, the family will decide whether the organ will be uh, transplanted or will be donated to some recipient. So I, I just want to ask, at one time that this patient lost, lose their patient's autonomy. That's the first one. Second one is, I think it's quite a simple question, but I just want to ask. So if uh, there are patients uh, who would like to sell or do we have any uh, I would say a couple transaction of uh, jewel belly organ, doctor? So well, for whatever reasons, it can be a financial crisis. So it, it can, uh, can it be done or not, doctor, in Malaysia? Uh, that's okay. Awful. Let me answer. Uh, let me answer the second question first. So in in the in Malaysia, we do not have. So there's no there's no such thing as selling or anything like that. But in other countries like India and China, we know. Uh, there's some, especially those poor people, they do sell their organ uh, for certain, but it's all syndicate lah, basically. But but in this country, we don't. But we do have uh, what we call the living donor. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe the same siblings, or maybe uh, uh, not same siblings, somebody who has got most close uh, identical kind of, uh, uh, what do you call, when they look go through all this genetic kind of thing, suitable to be a donor and recipient other than this country but 
but we do not have uh, apa nama uh, the one that you mentioned just now lah. Okay, that's number number two lah. Now to answer the first one, uh, basically um, in this country, I can only quote this country. In this country, basically um, a few scenarios. Scenario number one, you a patient like myself can be a pleasure to become a organ donor. So you will you will be once you register, then you will be given a card. Uh, but in certain country, for example, like in Australia, because uh, I, I studied there last time, uh, that is written on your driving license. So, so here we don't we don't put it on the driving license, but we have a special card that we 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 will carry uh, in our wallet. Okay, just if anything happen to us, uh, then it's easier to to for the managing uh, team or doctor to decide. Uh, but again, even you are an uh, organ donor, uh, eventually the decision to give uh, uh, what you call whether to proceed or not to proceed will depends on your on the family members. Maksudnya, bukan bermaksud walaupun you dah dekat, automat it becomes automatic. No. So that means to say the managing team and the local uh, organ punya coordinator tu will re-ask, mana re-ask and discuss new, kata okay look he is an organ pleasure he wish to transplant dia punya to donate dia make ini for example so do you wish to proceed or not? kalau pada masa tu, the family members cakap no, then we cannot proceed right? so that scenario, scenario number one scenario number two where the patient apa nama Uh, dia tak tak declare sama ada he he or she is a pleasure or not but once diagnosed with brain death of course you cannot reflect because the patient is really brain death so now the responsibility falls on the or shoulder of the of the of the uh, family members uh, next of kin doctor next of kin correct so uh, maksudnya uh, then dia punya coordinator local coordinator will then discuss with the next of kin whether they are actually agree or not agree for organ donation. Kalau dia agree, boleh proceed. Tak ada masalah. Even patient is not a pleasure. No issue. So, maksudnya to answer back your uh, question tu, the loss of autonomy tu, basically once you are branded, you already lose your autonomy lah. Regardless, sama ada you are pleasure or not pleasure pun. Because the decision eventually is decided by the next of kin. Do I answer your question? Uh, yes, pretty much better. Thank you so much. Cuma ni, I 